Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Hope International Affiliated Centers webinar series. My name is Rayanne, and I am the Assistant Director of Family Justice Center Programs. I'm excited to host this series that will showcase each of our affiliated centers by giving them an opportunity to share information about their sites and the work they are doing in their community. For more information about becoming an affiliated center or creating a center in your community, please visit our website at allianceforhope.com. I now have the great pleasure of introducing Michelle Morgan, who will introduce herself and take you on a tour of One Safe Place Parent Regional Family Justice Center. Michelle? Hello. Great to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction. So I'm just going to jump right on into it um, and really talk to everyone about One Safe Place. We are located in Fort Worth, Texas, and I've got some visuals so everyone can kind of see um, what our center is and kind of some of the things that we've done and hopefully something that we've gone over here will um, help some of you for sure. So a little bit about um, who we are. Um, we are in Fort Worth, Texas, um, in Tarrant County. Our population in our county is 1.9 million, um, estimated in 2016. Um, our county is the third most populous county in Texas. The city of Fort Worth um, has the highest um, population rate, a um, little over eight, 850,000, um, and they are the only city in our county that has public transportation. One of the other things that is very unique about our county is that we have four, 42 different municipalities. Basically what that means is that we have 42 different law enforcement agencies. And when we first started having the conversation in our community about building a family justice center, there were many that thought you can't accomplish building a family justice center with 42 different law enforcement agencies. You know, the city of San Diego, um, the county of Bear County that has maybe two or three um, different law enforcement agencies has been successful, but not with 42 different law enforcement entities. And I'm here to tell you that you can. Um, we have done that. Um, it is challenging and it's something that we work on um, every day and every year we grow our law enforcement partners. Um, but it, it can be done and because we had 42 municipalities that almost automatically increased the need um, for us to really be able to build a family justice center in our community. So for us, just a very quick snapshot of our history and how it got started for us. Um, in 2004, President Bush released those federal dollars for 15 family justice centers um, to apply and here in our county we applied just like many others and we did not receive that funding i am here to tell you for us that was probably a blessing in disguise we weren't ready for a project of this magnitude back in 2004. after that project um, after we were denied um, it, the project kind of went away um, and no one really talked about it anymore. The first time that we had people in our community coming together and talking about domestic violence was when we all got together to apply for that presidential um, grant in 2004. After that, it kind of went away. So in 2007, one of the things, um, by that time, we had finally formed um, the Tarrant County Council on Family Violence, um, which was a great onset of applying for that initial grant. In 2007, we, um, we received a formal membership vote to dedicate a committee to review the operations of Family Justice Center, because here's what happened. In 2007, someone mentioned in the council, hey, whatever happened to those Family Justice Centers? And we said, well, hey, what did happen? So we began to look and what we began to see is it wasn't just the, the same 15, there were now like 60 operational centers that had happened and they had done it without federal funding. So we said, mm, maybe we need to take a look at this. So in 2009, what we refer to as the stars align, meaning we just had several different things in our community that all kind of lined up at the same time that basically magic happened. Um, we had a police chief at the time for Fort Worth Police Department that had come from Phoenix, Arizona, who was very familiar with Family Justice Center projects. And he came here to the city of Fort Worth and wanted to know where was our Family Justice Center. Um, we also had a nonprofit crime prevention organization named Safe City Commission um, at the time, um, was also looking to um, expand um, 
operations. And we also had um, a very uh, philanthropic family that was also challenging that nonprofit organization to look at different areas that we could impact children. So all of that being said, um, we presented the Family Justice Center project and everyone thought that that was a great next step to move forward to having that in our community. So in 2009, underneath the leadership of the Fort Worth Police Department, they applied and received a federal stimulus grant through, it was actually a recovery act, um, administered um, through OVW. Um, that grant literally was $50,000, which is really just small potatoes. And with that grant, we were then able to contract with the Alliance for Hope International and really began our planning process. So in 2010, the first thing we did is we had a very small multidisciplinary team that traveled. Um, we visited centers in Phoenix, um, in Mesa, Arizona, Scottsdale, Glendale, Arizona. We went down, um, down in our own hometown into San Antonio, Texas, and we also went to Albuquerque, New Mexico. The next thing we did is, um, we act, this isn't on, on the PowerPoint, but one of the things we did is we bought all of Gail and Casey's books that they had written at that point, um, and we bought them for all of our steering committee members and said, your homework is to read all of these books. And so we developed that steering committee. And at that time, San Diego, California was the model. And so we said, we've got 15 members on our steering committee. And that grant that included that 50,000 that we wrote in 2009 allowed for us to send 15 committee members to San Diego. Because one of the things that we wanted to know, if that's the model center, we need to go there. We need to make sure that our steering committee sees what it is that we're attempting to accomplish. So we went there together as a team. And I'll tell you, I coordinated all those flats. That was very challenging, but we were able to accomplish it. And then after that, that really kicked off our next stage. Um, we did our stakeholder meetings. Um, we, you know, had Casey and Gail um, in, in front of over 100 people, really getting that community buy-in. We did community meetings. We did um, key focus group with survivors. We did two key focus groups. Um, and all of the survivors in those groups said that, yes, would you rather go to one location? And unanimously across the board, yes, that's what they want to do. And then we accomplished our three-day strategic planning process um, for three days. And you can see that picture there. Um, everyone starting with the I'm in um, picture there. Um, with that street, uh, three day strategic planning process, we had a hundred individuals, sometimes different individuals, every, every single day um, that were um, coming to that three day strategic planning process. And then in 2011, um, what I call is planning, planning, planning. It was the year of planning. Um, at that point in time, all of us had been, um, all of us had been doing um the planning of the project um, while we had other full-time jobs. So um, one of the things that happened is um, our nonprofit crime prevention organization um, went to our uh, chief of police of Fort Worth and said, you know, when, when do we need we need to have a full-time project manager. And so um, at that point in time, they hired a full-time project manager. At that time, personally, I was working at Fort Worth Police Department um, as the victim assistance coordinator overseeing a small victim assistance unit. Um, and I, I was leading some of that planning process. And so basically the team went to the chief and asked for him to put me on loan. So at that point in time, um, I was which was kind of strange because I was still on the books at the police department, um, but moved locations, packed up my office, and did nothing but work on the planning of building the Family Justice Center. Um, we located our fir first home that you can see there on the left. Um, it was a gorgeous home, an attorney owned that home. But after we began to do some our due diligence, um, we had a lot of problems. That home is gorgeous, but it's also a historical marker. And so as we began to talk to the homeowner, we realized that it just would not be realistic for us to have that and would cost thousands of dollars to redo the piping, piping underneath the grounds. Um, one of the things that we, we were able to discover is for him to get approval to redo ceiling, ceiling fans in that home. It took him over a year to get approval to do that. So we knew that that just was not going to be effective for us. So we began to look and see, okay, well, what else is next? And so on the right, you can see um, where we currently are. Um, that, that was our future home and where we are. Um, and one of the things as we found that, um, the home that you see there 
on the right hand side, it had to be renovated. Um, we had some asbestos in that building and so we had to go through a complete renovation. The problem that we had is we were ready to move forward. Um, the timing was right. We had the city of Fort Worth that was ready to commit operational dollars to the Family Justice Center, which was rare. And then we also had a commitment to our partnership from our domestic violence nonprofit provider, our shelter provider. So it was hugely important for us to capitalize on both of those partnerships and begin. So we began to start small and um, as Gail and Casey say, um, start small and dream big. And so that's exactly what we did. So um, I refer to it as our trailer park we put on the corner because that's exactly what we did. Um, this was our temporary buildings. Um, as you can see in the pictures, we had eight buildings um, that we put together and we um, did, we, we call that the boardwalk that we created. We created a security door. We still had access. Um, and then where you see one safe place, um, we put, um, um, it was a security fence around. Um, it also helped um, clean up the aesthetics that we literally put temporary buildings in our future parking lot. And um, we incorporated art into everything that we did. And people saw those art boards and said, what is one safe place? What is going on there? And so it was a good staple. And we were in our temporary facilities for two and a half years. At first, I was disappointed. However, I'm going to tell you that starting small was the wisest thing that we could have ever done because we were really able to stop the planning and go straight into operation. But instead of going into a massive operation, we were able to go ahead and start small and really grow into this partnership. And I felt like that has been really key and vital to our success as we've gotten much bigger through the years. So here, October 2014, is when we moved into our new building. Um, our new building is 67,000 square foot. Today, we have 22 on-site partner agencies. What you're looking at before you is our lobby. So when you walk in either of our doors, this is a space that you're walking into. Um, the green wall directly in front is a live green wall um, that we keep. Um, that's our security desk. There's, um, there's no glass there. Um, we have different protective and security measures in place um, but when everyone walks in um, they have this sense of hopefully respect um, and integrity and welcome when they walk through our site we have an art gallery and one of the other things of special notation here for us is there's not a whole lot of seating in this area and that is completely by design um, when someone comes in we get them checked in and we get them behind that glass secure door um, to make sure that they're in a safe place we intentionally don't want them waiting in this gallery area we want to check them in the best that we can and get them back behind those secured doors to make sure that they're safe because anyone can walk through those front doors so the next phase is I'm going to kind of walk you through our center as you are here with me and show you a couple pictures and spotlight some of our areas uh, these are pictures of our client lounge and our intake rooms um, you can see they're very um, homey when I used to work for the police department our interview rooms did not look like this not even the least um, our interview rooms when I worked at the police department were literally where all of the broken down furniture ended up and by design we have made this look like a living room like it's homey um, the other thing of special note that I want to point out is um, we had some windows that were in these intake rooms um, we didn't want to restrict all of the light because the light is very important however we also couldn't breach confidentiality so we just purchased very inexpensive about $50 on each of these little shade structures that still makes it look like it's a home furnishing and it still has that comfortable feeling um, when you walk into either that lounge or some of our intake rooms. We have soft lighting in each of those rooms and then all of them have either vinyl or leather so it's very easy to clean um, and, and keep up. The other thing in both of these areas that you can see on the picture on the right, um, you see the peace sign. That's an Imagine No Violence art project that we have. And so we have very hopeful um, Imagine No Violence artworks that either a middle school or a high school kid has done in our community um, to talk about Imagine No Violence and Pathways to Hope. And so we've incorporated those into those intake rooms where people are sometimes, oftentimes searching 
for hope. And then in the lounge area on the left, um, you'll see a much larger gallery picture. And so we partnered with one of our um, art galleries here, our art gallery studios. Um, and some of these pictures are a value of somewhere between ten to $20,000. And so they have them on display, but they don't have enough wall space in their own center to display them all. So we partnered with them and they put them on display at our center. They're gorgeous. Clients love them. They, they're very soft um, in the space and um, they're just very comforting. Um, if, if any of those art pieces do sell, then the art studio comes over and they take that piece off the wall and then they put a new piece on there. And so that's an easy, easy partnership for us um, to be able to brighten our space. So two other core um, critical pieces for us is our chapel. We have a full-time chaplain um, that works on site with us. And so for those that need spiritual support services, we have a chaplain that's available. One of the key things that our full-time chaplain does is just not only providing spiritual support to clients, but she's also there for all of our employees. We have over 100 employees that are in the building and we all have our own individual life challenges that happen. And so she's also there for support for them um, as well. Um, we have a courtroom and so oftentimes our courtroom is um, kind of in the back. Our courtroom is some is um, in the back of our client service delivery area and in the in the it kind of hides in the back and people sometimes when they go back are um, somewhat surprised and shocked that we have a courtroom. And so one of the reasons why we decided to go ahead and build a courtroom in the back is because in our initial focus groups when we ask victims of domestic violence where's the scariest place you go hands down they always identify court so we wanted to make sure that that was a critical component that we address in our center so we have a therapist that does a, a court prep a training program we use it for mock our attorneys will take clients in there and get them prepared um, but our therapist is in there the most and then we also use this for training since we've opened the family justice center what we didn't realize is we have had more of our staff have been called for expert witnesses and so some of them had no training whatsoever in how to testify in court and so we've had some of our attorneys have even trained our staff in the courtroom as well so that's a great focal point um, that we have in our center so a couple of other things to spotlight here is our success store. Um, we have a job skills um, organization that does basic and advanced job skills classes. And um, they also oversee our success store, which looks very much like a department store. Um, JC Penney's um, has their headquarters here in our Metroplex. And so we've been very fortunate that about once a quarter, we send a truck um, to go get donations from Penney's. And then we have volunteers that are constantly setting up the store to make sure that it looks like a department store and not like a thrift store um, and um, clients are able to um, to go shopping in here and make sure that they've got um, clothes for um, jobs or for court or whatever their needs may be the other thing that's very unique about our space as you move up to our second and our third levels um, on the right hand side that's a, a corner shot of our pod space and so this is a conversation that we have and a lot of other family justice centers want to talk to us about like, okay, like how is it really? Because what you see here is that all of our team is in open pods. So all of our CEOs, um, all of our um, leadership and managers, all, all of our investigators, our investigator supervisors on our second floor, they are all in open pods. So as you can see, it's a pod, it's not a cubicle. So it's a little bit more elevated. Um, it's a little bit nicer. Um, and um, the reason that we opted to go this direction is because we really did study some private corporations in our early designs to see for those private organizations that are really well known for their collaborations, what's the key? What's been the key to their success? And hands down, every single one that we looked at, it was open pod style. And when you think about it, if you're building a collaboration where you need to be transparent, it's kind of difficult to be transparent when you have those walls built. And I get it doesn't work for everyone, but we had the opportunity um, to go ahead and build the space like those that had the success. And so we're in all open pod space. Um, and so it can be challenging at times, but we really just work through those. And we really do believe that the open pod space has really enhanced our collaborations among partners. 
The other thing, um, I have heard other family justice centers talk about um, one of the things that they wish that they would have done is build more meeting space. And so we have a lot of different rooms available for meetings. Um, you'll see um, in the top left, that's a computer lab that we have. I believe we have three or four um, computer labs um, that are outfitted for one of our partner agencies to do computer classes. Um, we have about three three to four classrooms that are available for either client service delivery or for partners to have partnership meetings. Um, when you do have open pod space, you need to make sure that you have a bunch of meeting spaces that people can meet. On our third floor, we have a conference room. On our second floor, we have three conference rooms. And all of these that you're seeing in front of you are all additional meeting rooms on our first floor as well. And then on the very bottom, that's our large auditorium space. Um, we can fit um, with chairs in there with no tables. We can fit somewhere about 150 individuals. Um, if we add um, tables in there, our max capacity is just a little over 100 people um, with the tables. And so that's been a very good multi-purpose room. We're able to hold a bunch of large meetings, um, have the Alliance for Hope come and host their four-day advanced course in this meeting. We've had um, one of our universities has done multiple trainings. I have a substance abuse behavioral health symposium that's going on tomorrow for half a day. So this space has been really fantastic to be able to turn it into a toy drive to be able to provide toys to clients during the Christmas holidays. Today we were celebrating our Thanksgiving luncheon in this space and tomorrow morning it's going to be used to train about 140 professionals about substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, so training um, has been critical, something that we built into our Family Justice Center. And then the last picture that I have for you is our Reese Jones Child Development Center. Um, this was something as we went on our tours, um, we began to notice and really wanted to see. So when clients are coming in, what, what were family justice centers doing with children? Because we know that sometimes that's a barrier to access services. And so we opted to run a full-time licensed child care center and we have a partner which took quite a bit of time um, I will tell you when we when we first started talking about doing a licensed daycare center I had um, people that said well we can do that but you need to add three hundred thousand dollars to your annual budget and I said yeah that's that's not our definition of how partnership works so we're not looking to add something to our budget. We're looking to, you know, expand upon something that someone is already doing in our community and doing it well and having them come and do that with us. So it took a little time, um, but we were able to find um, someone who was willing like us to think outside the box. So we found that provider and how this works is our licensed daycare is open to, a to the community for a competitive rate. It is also available to any employee that works for one of those 22 partner agencies. They do not have to be on site. They can, as an example, they can work for our Tarrant County District Attorney's Office and be an attorney that works in the downtown courthouse. As long as they are an employee of a partner agency, then they get a discounted rate for putting their employ for putting their ch children here. And so we felt as though that was important to offer that incentive to our employees. And then the the most critical way that the daycare center helps us is in drop-ins. So uh, they hold about ten or twelve slots. And so they don't fill 10 or 12 slots um, for us. And so when we have that individual that walks in that needs services and doesn't have anyone to watch their kids, then we can temporarily enroll them in the drop-in care. And we can do that about 10 to 12. Um, after 6.30 for all of our evening classes, it's all drop-in care um, at that point in time because licensed care has stopped. So we may have somewhere between 10 to 20 kids um, on any given night. Um, in our evening classes. So my name is Michelle Morgan again. Um, our contact information is 817-916-4323 um, is our telephone number or you're more than welcome to join us um, on our website at onesafeplace.org. Hi Michelle, thank you so much. That was fabulous. I have a follow-up question to your, your um, children's center. The drop-in slots, are those free to the clients? Yes, all services provided on-site to clients are free. Okay, great. I thought so. I just wanted to clarify 
That was amazing. Your center is gorgeous. And I'm really happy that you said from the get go that you started small because, because your center is so impressive and you off not only in size, but the services you provide and, and the number of um, partners that you have that I think that would feel intimidating to the communities that are thinking about opening. So, yes. so I absolutely agree that starting small is the best way to go, but your center is fabulous. Um, Thank you. Welcome. So one of the questions I have for you is, um, what changes have you seen in your community because of your center? So the changes that we've seen here at One Safe Place is, number one, is it's much easier to access services in one location. In 2006, um, one of our councils did a community assessment to identify how many different locations does a victim of domestic violence potentially have to go to before they can get out of that abusive situation. And in our county alone, which remember is not all, does not all provide public transportation, they identified up to 30 different locations, which is just unrealistic. So the one thing is it has been much easier to access services. The other thing we have really been able, you know, the scariest thing with the Family Justice Center coming into a community that already has existing agencies. I mean, as an example, our domestic violence organization, our rape crisis, our child advocacy center had been embedded in our community for 20, 30 years. And the threat is that, oh, you're going to build a family justice center. And the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to take our money. Exactly. What we have really seen happen is quite the opposite. When you come together as a team, you can better leverage that that cost. And then the pie gets bigger. I mean, it truly, truly does. But what has to happen is people have to be open and take a little bit of risk to have the conversation. Like, I need to know, like, you know, where some of my partners, where their biggest funders are. And then I have to be able to say, like, no, that's their bread and butter. I'm going to stay away from that. And then, hey, let's collectively go after this together. So you kind of have to strategize. And so that that's a hard risk for any nonprofit to jump into. And so we also have to realize that. And that comes with trust and relationships. The other things that we have really seen, um, number one, you know, turnover happens. And so I, I hear a lot of other family justice centers or new and developing, you know, they'll, they'll have one partner that is what we would call to or refer as that naysayer. I'm here to tell you, we have them too. Like it's, it's not all peaches and cream. <laughs> Everyone has that person. But what I can, what I can say is that just be persistent because that individual may not be in that position forever and then you may have a new opportunity and we've had several of those opportunities as an example we've had a new DA um, that has taken over um, and at first they decentralized all of the family violence unit and we were really concerned wait a second like this is the opposite direction of what we want to go but as we began to sit down and have open dialogue and really present the numbers we were very impressed with the new da who went back and looked at the numbers and said wait like i'm wrong and came out and said this is driving our crime rate and i'm seeing far more of these numbers and then very quickly re-centralized a new unit that is looking at felony offenses and as a result and as a result of partnering um, and being an affiliated site and having um, the advantages of reduced cost and being able to send teams to the four day advanced strangulation course, we have able we've been able to change the landscape of how those cases are now being are, are happening in our community. Prior to our domestic violence agency and certainly our staff were very hesitant about testifying in cases. And now they wouldn't dare take a felony case to court without calling someone from our multi-agency team here at the Family Justice Center and asking them to testify in those cases with, by the way, the victim testifying for the defendant. And our DA's office is now getting very large numbers in some of these felony cases. And so those are some huge things that we have really seen um, that has absolutely shifted and changed the way that domestic violence is, is, is happening. And our Family Justice Center has had a direct impact on those things in our community. That's amazing. Congratulations. That's fabulous. Thanks. 
And one last question, and you, you talked about it, you mentioned it just now a little bit about the cost savings, but can you say briefly um, why you affiliated, why you became an affiliated center and some of the some of the ways that that's helped your center, if at all? Yeah, sure. So one of the reasons why we affiliated is, it's number one for me, it's, it's a no brainer. Um, <laughs> There needs to be credibility. There needs to, we need to make sure that those that say that they are family justice centers are practicing those guiding principles. And one of the ways to to ensure that that's happening across the board is to go through this affiliation process. And I'm going to tell you for us, it elevates us within our community to be able to say that we are part of something just bigger than Fort Worth, Texas. I mean, it's a big deal to be able to say that we are part of this affiliated process through Alliance for Hope International, nationally and internationally across the world. And then, you know, so that credibility, number one, is just very valuable. The second thing that it does is, I mean, we have, we've been able to save so much money in terms of signing multidisciplinary teams up for the annual conference. Um, we got to send four people to um, South Carolina, I believe, um, to go through a four-day advanced course at no cost because we're an affiliated site. Um, we get discounts um, on any conference or any training that the Alliance for Hope um, for Hope International puts on, um, we're in direct conversation with not just Gail and Casey, but with all the staff at the Alliance for Hope. And when we have problems or we have challenges, they are truly our family that does not live in Fort Worth, Texas, that we can connect with. And when we have those challenges in our community, it's important to be able to reach out to those for guidance and advice that have been through this, not just within their own community, but with many of us across the nation. And so that in and of itself is absolutely invaluable. And so if you are a family justice center that's considering should I or should I not, it, it is a low cost fee that will provide so much more credibility to you and your center and then also provide a cost savings for you. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you so much for presenting your your center um, and being part of our webinar series. And for those of you who have just viewed this webinar, um, thank you so much for your time. And I encourage you to take a look at some of the other center webinars to get um, information about their centers as well. So Michelle, thank you very much and everyone have a great day.